major is called Biology for Voters. It's online as a MOOC if you want to see what that's about. But my research for the past 16 years has been at a biotech here in the Bay Area called Sagamo. We invented human gene editing. Um, I moved to Seattle three months ago to work at a place called Altius, which I'm happy to explain uh, if there is time. I'm here to tell you about Humans 3.0. Bear with me as I explain what that is. In the spirit of the sort of renaissance approach to the world that Piero has provided for this, I wanted to start with a quote from Le Marquis de Condorcet. Those of you who read French or speak French, there's the original. And back in the late 18th century, he said, the object of the work I've undertaken uh, is that nature has assigned no limits to the perfecting of human faculties, that the perfectibility of humans is truly indefinite, that the progress of this perfectibility has no limit other than the duration of the globe on which nature has placed us. Doubtless its progress will be, be more or less rapid, but never will humans retrograde. Um, I, I know in the wake of just happened, <laughs> we have reason to question whether he was right. Uh, neighbors at UCSF of the previous speaker, and thank you, by the way, for a fantastic talk, and really inspiring, made the following remarkable discovery that will provide me the introduction to um, the topic today. These are several people studied for how active they are. They are wearing an activity monitor. So this, this signal means they're up and about, and this means they're asleep. And what you find when you look at these data, each of these blocks as an hour, is they're able to go by on four to six hours of sleep a night with absolutely no adverse effect on their physiology, which is unusual. Most people need seven to eight hours. Living your entire life on four to six hours is extremely rare. What makes this stunning is that this is genetic and that the cause of this is one genetic change in one gene called DEC2. You change one letter in one gene of the human genetic code in, and you acquire the ability to go on four to five hours of sleep. What would I give to have that <laughs> mutation? I want it. Oh, <laughs> believe me. Believe me. What would I give? So, we live in a world where it is seriously feasible to talk about making that change de novo in a conventional human, for example, by way of genetic enhancement for air traffic controllers. And this is unequivocally not science fictional. This is binarily real. As strange as that may be. Example two, in Pakistan and elsewhere, very rarely, there are people with something called congenital insensitivity to pain. Uh, the reason I mention Pakistan is scientists studied a family that had a 14-year-old boy that performed, st performed street theater. He walked on coals, put knives through his forearms, but experienced no pain. He died uh, shortly before or after his 14th birthday. He jumped on a bed off a house roof. This is genetic and is caused, again, by a single genetic change in one gene called MAV1.7. And if you get rid of that gene in human DNA, you acquire this ability. We live in a time when it is seriously feasible to talk about taking people who don't have that mutation and making it. Why? Well, for example, consider special forces soldiers that will be pain free. So how is that going to happen? It's going to happen via genome editing. This is an image my colleagues back at San Juan I conjured up. The notion is that you have a Sort of a, you sit at the D at your DNA as if you were sitting at a keyboard, typing up, retyping your genetic code in real time. What I'll do is I'll spend just a couple of minutes explaining how this works, and spend the rest of the talk showing you what we've and others have done with it and where it's headed next. So the human genome is long. The, the best um, a sort of a description of how long it is comes from Radiolab. And they remind us that if you read one letter of the human DNA a second, so go G, A, T, G, it will take you a century to read the human genome. It is a long thing. So to change a gene, a single one, you have to be able to find it in this enormous string of text. And you have to fight with the fact that the human DNA is massively resistant to change. We have all of these molecular machines that are there to protect us from having our DNA be altered. Every time you step into the sun, this machinery kicks in and repairs the changes to your DNA that the sun has made, and so on and so on. 
the solution emerged out of the realization that one way to inspire change in your DNA is to actually break it. So break both strands. And when you do that, Mother Nature puts the ends back together, but has a tendency to make a mistake. The mistake comes in one of two flavors. She either gains or loses a few letters of genetic code where the break was. That's creating a mutation. Separately, she sometimes uses a related piece of DNA to copy-paste the missing information into the break. So you can subvert her. You can provide a new piece of DNA, and she naively will stick it into the chromosome. So gene editing, in its sort of 7.45 PM on a rainy Wednesday form, is you cut the DNA, and you get an edited gene. What kinds of editings do you get? You can get rid of a gene. That's called a gene knockout. You can correct a mutation, such as something that causes sickle cell disease, for example. Or you can stick in something much larger. And all of this is happening, and I'll tell you why. Before I do that, I need to introduce to you this. How is this physically done? This is physically done by engineering a protein-based nanorobot. So protein-based molecular scissors that are put together in a lab by engineers of proteins, such as yours truly. And they come in four separate flavors. None of this matters. All of you have heard of CRISPR. And this probably is the only one that you need to know because this is the most widely used. This is the only one in the clinic, but that's not important. What matters is they all do the same thing. They are built to go into your cell, go into the nucleus where the DNA is, find one gene and cut it. And then nature takes her course. This went into the clinic seven years ago. But my colleagues back at Sangamo and I realized that we could use this as a treatment for HIV. Back in the early 90s, as the HIV epidemic was ravaging the gay community of San Francisco, among others, scientists discovered and physicians that some partners of gay men who have died of AIDS, who reported having had unprotected sex with them, remained HIV free. They were studied at the genetic level and were found to be mutants. They are naturally resistant to HIV because they lack a gene called CCR5. And CCR5 makes a protein which is the molecular door through which HIV enters into our cells. So if by chance you don't have that gene, you're resistant to HIV. But the problem is only 1% of humanity has that. And that doesn't really help the 39 million people worldwide and 1.1 million people in the States who have HIV right now. So this is Matt Sharp. I will explain later if somebody is interested who that is. That's the very famous Timothy Brown, the only person in history who was cured of his HIV. And that's Matt Sharp, one of the subjects on our trial. And what we did to him is we edited his DNA to get rid of CCR5, which is here on chromosome 3, in the hope of creating a compartment of the immune system that will be protected from the virus. How was this done technically? We bring Matt or other patients like him, subjects, into the clinic, take out their T cells, which are the white blood cells that protect us from infection, get rid of the CCR5 gene by cutting that with this nucleus, and then putting the cells back in. Where is this clinically? 80 subjects have been treated. And in the most recent cohort, three quarters of the subjects have been able to stop their antiretrovirus. In other words, their immune system, now genetically engineered, can control HIV by itself because it's genetically resistant to entry of the virus into it. I should emphasize this is just a phase one, two trial. And if you're interested in this, follow the news. This will doubtless be reported that full clinical development will be complete sometime by the end of 2018. How many cells did you have to fix to do that? How many? Yeah. About 100 million. So you just a fraction of all this. Like less, than, less, less than 10%. Oh. What, what's somebody else's? So you just get one and then you just grow them. And... That's right. T cells are expandable in addition. Don't you have to change the polymer? <clears throat> what a fantastic question. Um, so there's this thing called the central memory T cell, which is essentially the stem cell of the T cell compartment. It, it, is, a, it is eternal. Well, I mean, a, it lives as long as the human. <laughs> so where is this going next? 
This is about, round numbers, I'm glad you're sitting down, about $600,000 a patient. Because you have to bring the person in, take out the T-cells in the sterile environments, put all of this stuff in. So where this is going next, and the clinical trial is open, is for editing of organs in a human, where instead of taking the cells out, we put the editor in on a virus, and the virus goes to the organ and does the editing. And the first clinical trial that's going to start this year is for the disease that changed history. This is Tsarev Chalikseh to my fellow Russians and myself, Prince Alexis to, the, uh, to everybody else. He was healed by Rasputin, who, as you know, did not found the record store and telegraph. He, um, <laughs> he, was a, he was a charlatan who lied to the royal family that he could treat this child's blood clotting disorder, which is hemophilia B. E. Um, um, that's right. And so the proposal is, um, to repair the liver in people who have hemophilia B. So to inject the editor, which will go into the bloodstream, go into the liver, put the normal gene back in, and we hope read, read the subjects of the disease. This is exciting to me because this really addresses the logistics problem. There's a difference between having to take cells and fix them in a sterile environment, and this essentially is just an injection. You just get an intravenous injection of the editor. So where is this going? Um, this is Carly Koch. She was written about in the New York Times. She has a, def a genetic deficiency of the immune system, and there is no current treatment for it. So she's planning to die. And uh, the article in the Times had a picture of her and her mom discussing her funeral and how they're going to distribute her toys, what music they're going to play at her memorial. So just awful, heart-wrenching stuff. It's particularly heart-wrenching to me as a gene editor because we know what's wrong with her. We know that on the short arm of chromosome 9 is a gene called DOC8, and she has a mutation in it, and that's what's killing her. So before editing, this was essentially unreachable. Well, now that has changed, because the strategic vision for this technology is to essentially, more or less, eliminate genetic disease. Because once, you've changed, once you can change DNA, then you know you've changed the root cause. But I want to be sort of careful about giving you a sense of timing. So we have clinical trials right now for um, H severe disease such as HIV or hemophilia or other genetic disorders. Two children in England have been treated who have cancer by gene editing. We will know by the end of next year if this is safe and effective. And if it is safe and effective, then undoubtedly Sangamo and many other companies as well as academic groups will begin broader clinical development for single gene disorders. Sickle, for example, and cystic fibrosis will be premier among them. If that is safe and effective, then the next step will be genetic therapy for the prevention of disease. For example, cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease can be prevented by preemptive gene editing. We know which genes to change to significantly reduce the risk of those two. But this cannot go into the clinic until we know that treatment for existing disorders is safe and effective, such as just the nature of how these things are done. So this will probably start in five years, maybe less. If that is shown to be safe and effective, then you will see me sign up for that trial to repair that sleep gene so that I can go about on four hours of sleep. That, that's going to be the time. So in the next six hours. Was that? Four hours? Four to, four, four to six. Four to six. So, you know, I, I told you humans 3.0, where, where is that sort of operating system nomenclature coming from? We, we started about 150,000 years ago. Um, then 50,000 years ago, we colonized the planet. And what immediately happened is Darwinian selection, where, you know, folks in Northern Europe who domesticated the cow became genetically modified so that they could drink milk as adults, or folks in Southeast China became genetically modified so they couldn't drink alcohol, or, you know, and so on, or Tibetans became genetically modified so that they could live at high altitude. So we now live in an era where we have sort of accelerated our biological selves, where we are, the 21st century will be the century when humans have started to change their own DNA. Um, this is going to be a really interesting time. All right, I have five minutes, and I want to tell you about something that I think will impact the planet more than editing of humans which is editing of non-humans. I'll tell you two stories. And I have to be very careful here because I'm in Berkeley, so to, to, mention, genet to mention genetically modified organisms, crops here is 
really calls for sort of. Um, so, but this is a company called Calix. It's in Minnesota. They really emphasize that. Um, <laughs> and they have made a pretty remarkable potato. So it turns out that the potato has to be stored because you only harvest them once a year. But once you store it, it develops a chemical invariably, which is really harmful. And the chemical, upon deep frying, makes acrylamide, which is a carcinogen. So the next time you, you take down a large bag of french fries, give some thought to whether, you know. Um, so there is one gene in potato DNA which is responsible for that. And so scientists at Calix have used gene editing to remove that gene. So this is an important point. They didn't add anything. So this is not a GMO in the traditional sense. <laughs> this is remove one gene. So we took out CCR5 from Matt Sharp. They took out the acrylamide gene from the potato. Using a viral vector? No, actually, that's a good question. No. I can, I, I can talk about the molecular biology in a second, but I, I, want, I want to show you the data first. But critically, there's no foreign DNA. There's no known potato DNA in this potato. It just lacks one gene. And this is a piece of data which requires no scientific background. It's one of those classic <laughs> big bar, small bar graphs. This is how much acrylamide a normal potato makes upon deep frying. This is the gene edited potato. Thank you very much. And critically, from just an aesthetic perspective, um, stored potatoes normal. When you deep fry them, make potato chips that look like that. They brown. It's like, ugh. And this is the gene edited potato. The most inspiring thing about this is that this company and others have gone with a vengeance, healthy vengeance, after various traits in various crops to make them better by gene editing. So there is a healthier oil soybean. There's the low acrylamide potato. There is a disease-resistant rice. Um, there is a low phytate corn. There is a mushroom that doesn't brown. And all of them have been made by editing. They have no foreign DNA. They just lack genes that cause these undesired traits. So what will happen to them in the future? How soon will you be able to eat them? Well, before I get to that, and in my last slide, allow me to introduce you to a gene-edited cow. Why have they gene-edited the cow? So it turns out that dairy cattle um, is naturally born to develop horns. But because dairy cattle is kept in large groups, the horns are dangerous to each other and to their handlers. So dairy cows are dehorned, and I'm sorry to say this, this is really sort of overwhelming, they're dehorned with the help of a blowtorch. So about 4.8 million calves per year are physically blowtorched so that they don't develop horns. The other option is to get rid of the gene in the cow DNA that makes the horns. There's only one gene. And so people did that by gene editing, and you get an extremely cute little cow, and what it seems to lack are horns. And what else it lacks? It lacks the gene that makes the horns. So I told you about a low acrylamide healthier potato that lacks one gene. I told you about a more humane lamb, a calf that lacks horns. The strategic question is, when will we be able to go to McDonald's and have a hamburger or have a milkshake made with milk from a de genetically dehorned cow and chase it with some french fries made with low acrylamide potatoes. So this is where we run into my last slide, which is a quote from Pierre de Beaumarchais, who described at the late 18th century this quote that describes the current debate about GMOs in the Western world, which is, it is not necessary to understand things in order to argue about them. As a scientist who has spent his entire life working on genetic engineering, I am aghast at the post-truth world in which the majority of the public debate about GMO lives. So it is poignant to me that the path of this more humane cough or this healthier potato to the consumer is obstructed not by any facts or reality, but by the sort of the genetic equivalent of denying the human sources of climate change. Um, that said, what I'm hopeful I did in the previous 19 minutes and 40 seconds is shared some information that will help you make form a more informed opinion about gene editing. And that is my last slide. 